Hey, welcome. Enter. It's kind of a gray day out there today, isn't it? So yeah, this is it. This is uh, two and a half years in the making. Um, the final show. What we've all been waiting, what I've been waiting for, I guess. Kind of um, an accumulation of all the paintings that I've been working on, with the exclusion of some. You know, these are uh, kind of my abstract paintings. This is the color side of the room. And I guess they can kind of speak to these skinny Rothkos. They fit perfectly on this column. And then, yeah, the, this is the figurative wall. I don't normally paint figures, but, you know, it's, uh, I guess I forced myself to at least attempt. Actually, this one is quite old. That painting's at least eight years old. And that informed this. And then which informed this. This is the only full figure painting that I've, you know, ever done, ever will do. And then these kind of more quiet paintings, still lifes, implication of a space, recognizable forms, cigarettes, classic still life. Menu painting. This is actually great. This is this painting actually belongs to uh, Maggie Friedman. Uh, it's a menu I wrote for a restaurant that I plan on opening. Some appropriated dishes. Some dishes are original. Like this, uh, the foie gras and scallop is a Marco Pierre White dish. But uh, and so is the lobster jelly. But the, the chicken roulade is mine. The duck egg mushroom raviolette, the uh, duxelle raviol is mine. Milk poached fish. You know, this is kind of, you know, um, you know, it's like a real depiction of a real thing, you know, to uh, implicate in the viewer. They can kind of go out and almost touch it, you know, it's deceiving the eye. These classic still life paintings, we all recognize these things, little clues, hints, you know, napkin with a phone number, cigarette just waiting to be plucked. And this one, this is new, this was new for the show these kind of stacked cylinders. I just kind of want to hit a ball at it. It's a little chip. <laughs> Would have knocked them all down. But it's just a painting. Another skinny Rothko. I have these these little quiet ones, kind of punctuated. That'll be punctuated throughout the show. These little cigarette butts, kind of timeouts, indications of time, time past, time about to pass, time has ended. Implicate existence into a painting. I mean, this one's great too. This is like, you know, it's like this kind of. These were informed by some other kind of tiered structure paintings that I did and, you know, um, kind of give the viewer something formally to grasp onto while, you know, also messing with, you know, 
messing with them. You know, like, they think they know what they're looking at, but not really. And obviously, this cap was referenced from the dunce cap. Um, but it's like, what is this? You know, this black orb, this polka dot hat, a little cigarette. You know, this kind of looks real. It looks like I can, you know, pick it up. It'd be heavy, though. It looks like a heavy object. It's kind of receding back into the space, but you can't because it's too tall. They didn't measure. Whoever made it didn't measure. Another uh, cigarette painting at the bottom there. I'll get hung up. You know, I want people to like, reach in and, you know, just take that and have a drag, put it back, move on to the next painting. You know, maybe relate to this coy young boy. Kind of contrapasto. This little smirk. I wonder what he's thinking. Yeah, these skinny Rothkos are great because, you know, typically a Rothko is like, you know, six feet wide, the good ones. But this is like eight inches wide. So you can kind of put this anywhere in your apartment. You know, and Rothko is the type of painter where, you know, if you walked into someone's house and you saw Rothko, you'd be like, God damn. Is that a Rothko? It's a skinny Rothko. It's more economical, you know? You can have a bunch of these in a row. You know, we always have those awkward wall spaces in our apartments that are typically too skinny to kind of house uh, a painting. So that's what, this is a good uh, option for that. Yeah, and these are kind of just technical exercises with color and, you know, a lot of underpainting and overpainting. Well, I guess all painting is overpainting. Seeing how various colors work over another, lights over darks, vice versa. It's kind of nice, you get these bleeding edges and it's a, a kind of a, you know, this uh, vibration and you can't really tell what's on top, and what's under, kind of visual play. This one's kind of funny. This one looks like language. Some l language. This little uh, thing there. But I guess it's always about trying to find, you know, a balance, um, whatever that means, or maybe kind of creating enough tension and then figuring out how to cre create a resolution or to resolve the tension, um, depending on if it's figurative or non-objective. I mean, um, you know, like uh, with this coy young boy painting, it was, you know, the, the black bar at the top was kind of ultimately the last gesture that, you know, really flattened the picture plane for me and kind of served as a gesture to kind of block off, you know, or to kind of contradict the illusionary space of this, you know, this interior, you know, that this figure inhabits. You know, it's kind of a curious painting. Not, he's not curious, he's coy. Sorry, it's coy. You know, the one thing I've always stuck with is, is the, the, the technique, the, the scumbling, the layer over layer. You know, it, it kind of ages the painting quite quickly, I think, and you know, visibly shows kind of this labor that has gone into it. I'm not saying that other types of painting don't show that. I mean, obviously it's there, but you know, to constantly kind of keep painting the same surface over and over, um, repainting, overpainting, 
you know, I've always tried to delete the brush stroke, um, you know, in the sense that they're, you know, really flat and at the same time not because there's this kind of weird depth perception thing going on with, you know, seeing the various colors that have, you know, hidden or obstructed by the layers on top. You know, you kind of get glimpses of them at the edges, which is, uh, an, you know, for me that was always kind of, you know, it's also been about how to, you know, how can I make a painting that is somewhat self-aware and sure, like, trompe l'oeil is a good tech, uh, you know, it's a good technique, but, you know, this, this kind of line and, and painting up to the line but never going over it was almost this kind of painting by numbers thing, but, you know, it was a way to just kind of hopefully have the painting acknowledge itself. Um, obviously, I'm doing that, but, you know. Um, yeah, trompe l'oeil, the technique of deceiving the eye. Um, but yeah, it's interesting once you, you know, put these things together to see what happens and, you know, hopefully things can get slightly more weird, whatever that means. I, I never had a, uh, I never really had an issue with the medium. Um, you know, it was always there for me, you know, the, the materials and the, and the process. Um, I just needed to combine them, uh, you know, paint and the painting. Um, I mean, I, I, I normally know usually what I, what I want to paint um, or the idea that I want to depict. Uh, but I was, you know, never concerned with with the, with the medium, um, with the medium at, at that specific moment in time. Um, I was never interested in questioning it. It was, it was painting. It was always going to be there. It was, always had been there, um, and I accepted that. You know, I have, I have my way of painting, uh, which is, you know, it's self-taught. I never, you know, I, I started painting in undergrad and, and we didn't have painting classes per se. Um, but, you know, I, I did some fooling around, uh, you know, questioning the medium then and, and uh, it got pretty tiring pretty quickly. You know, I just wanted to look at paintings. Um, just wanted to see interesting paintings, not some, you know, obscure, abstract uh, gesture kind of, you know, self-referential, using the medium to question its own integrity it was never really interesting to me, kind of overtly conceptual painting. I mean, sure, you can argue that all painting is conceptual, and yeah, but this is a spectrum. I'm on the opposite end of that spectrum. Um, it just wasn't my language. It's not my language, and I don't think it will ever be my language. I don't think about it like that. You know, I have questions concerning art in general that are, you know, painting is a sufficient medium to, you know, use. Isn't this sufficient means for those questions? I mean, I guess I more or less take painting for granted. Uh, you know, like it's, like I said, it's always been there, it always will be here, um, it will continue to be here. I don't think, you know, n new, f new forms or n new mediums or n new forms of media necessarily, they don't kind of supplant painting, they just crowd it and, you know, maybe just kind of push the crud out of the way and kind of skim the good painting from the top. So yeah, anyway, I mean, the problems in my painting, I mean, it, they vary depending on the painting and uh, I don't know, they're always really different. Um, but it's always been, I guess, about finding a balance or, you know, creating a tension and, and resolving it. Um, you know, like with this coy young boy painting, it was, you know, the, the painting sat finished essentially for a month and the final gesture I did was the black bar at the top and, and for me that, you know, that, that was the, 
that very quiet gesture that kind of broke that that illusionary space and, and really flattened it and, and kind of you know it, it did it, it did something to me that didn't allow me to enter the painting. It confronted me with the painting. Um, you know things like that. Um, I mean, you know, with with the with the the tiered, you know, the kind of um, this painting. Um, you know, it was the the last gesture was the polka dot hat. Um, you know, it sat essentially finished for some time before I was put, putting polka dots on it. It just worked. You know, the paintings are essentially finished before they're done. I use a black outline to map out the painting, and from there on, it's essentially painting by numbers. Um, you know, there's sometimes there's room for additional, you know, depictions of, of whatever space or pattern, but they're more or less done, and, and kind of then it becomes about the color and, you know, I get to a point where I've built up enough layers of, of paint that it, it comes down to like the final color. So if I finish an area, then the rest of the painting becomes, you know, the rest of the color choice becomes based on that initial, um, you know, that section that has been finished. The thing that I'm always stuck with is, is, is kind of this, this scumbling technique that I adopted very early on and it just stuck with me kind of you know this overpainting this repainting kind of it ages the painting quite quickly um, you know it, it, typically you know I, I've seen it you know a lot of paintings that I see it's it's kind of like one and done you know they, they finish the area and then it's blended you know whatever and it's and they don't touch it again with you know, with these, it's it's something funny about kind of constantly, re, you know, you know, these paintings have been painted essentially four or five times because of the amount of underpainting that is done. And sometimes the, the underpainting is completely blocked out and others it's not. Some areas only have, you know, one or two layers, some eight or nine. I mean, I don't count. Uh, but, you know, it's there and it's, you know, it's shown, you know, and specifically it's shown at the edges because I don't, you know, I paint up to the black edge. I don't paint over it. The, the colors never really match. So that was kind of always this gesture that I was hoping, you know, the kind of minutely make the painting self-aware in its own way. And I don't know. I think it's successful. Well, I, I guess, you know, it depends, you know, what, you know, like with the show, I was interested in how you know um, a painting confronts um, the viewer or their body or a body. Um, you know, with the non-objective, like I said earlier, it's, the color you know became the subject, um, and then you know so that's you know I guess not giving the viewer anything to kind of relate to other than color. Um, you know, I guess an engaged viewer would potentially, you know, access their unconscious and, you know, this inner reading, you know. And then with the more representational ones, not the figurative, but the kind of absence of the body in the paintings, you know, implicating the viewer with these forms, I guess you just generically say. Um, like, you know, I, like I said, it would, it would give them something to grab onto. Um, not physically, but to kind of relate to um, a direct relationship. You know, the, the, the times where there are kind of recognizable objects like cigarettes or, or packs of cigarettes or beers, um, they're essentially one-to-one. -one and uh, obviously they're not real, but they're the realest things I've ever depicted. And, um, you know, there's always kind of in implicating the viewer, I'm, I'm also trying to implicate a narrative in the painting and um, you know like these this kind of tiered structure as you know the stacked cylinders or the 
the cigarettes in the ashtrays that are um, yeah just just uh, kind of these indexes of, of an existence in the painting and uh, a passing you know passing of time or you know an implication like an implication of narrative it's as simple as that but yeah I mean with with, the, with these tiered structures and, and uh, you know cake paintings people have called them or like the the cans or the stacked cylinders it's like you know this, that was an interest kind of a formal investigation into you know a very small experience with the uncanny and uh, not Freud's uncanny but um, Ernst Jensch's uh, uncanny he was writing about the uncanny a few years prior and it's a very small experience. There's potential for a very small experience with the uncanny, and you know, breaking down the kind of what has to happen in any sort of stimuli or phenomenon formally. I mean, ultimately, this kind of unconscious recognition with with something, um, then you know, you become conscious of this thing, and it's, oh, it's not a, it's not actually a cake. It's just the form of a cake. Um, or these aren't cans, they're just cylinders, they're stacked like a stack of cans. Something that, you know, we kind of have all seen before at the carnival or the fair, you know, that game. But, um, yeah, and with the, these figurative paintings, you know, these young boys, um, I really don't have much to say about them, to be quite honest. Um, I think they say enough themselves that <laughs> I don't know, I guess you know what I um, you know what I love about painting is almost akin to what I love about poetry, even though I don't read it um, <laughs> but you know it has this ability to cram you know so much information you know into this one thing it's very sh you know concise depiction of something um, you know picture says a thousand words um, but you know that you more or less just kind of absorb all at once and it's usually different every time you, know, you come back to a painting you look at something different you notice something different you think about something different come back to a painting later and you know something else happened to you that informed this new experience with the painting it's 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 quite interesting you know, I was interested in, 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 you know, depicting in painting, you know, through whichever means, figurative or, or non-objective, was, you know, this kind of unsureness, this uncertainty, um, an anxiety almost. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's funny because we all, you know, we all love to think that we truly know something, but I don't think we really ever do. You know, we just convince ourselves that, um, we convince ourselves enough to speculate that we know something, um, but we never really know. You know, everything's always changing. We go back and forth. You know, if there's one thing that I am certain of, it's that I'm uncertain. So, I mean, yeah, I guess all these paintings, I mean, they're, they're not, they're all for the show. They're related in one way or another, or in some form, um, either through, uh, you know, kind of starting with, with these kind of non-figurative paintings and, and, you know, working through the different ways to put paint on a canvas. Um, you know, these are obviously kind of appropriating the means of, uh, you know, abstract, uh, abstract, abstract uh, expressionist paintings. Um, kind of just working with color, seeing what works. And, and they kind of inform the figurative paintings in a sense. And, you know, I, I find moments where, you know, a few colors work well, um, and then we'll try to replicate that. I mean, I obviously use a lot of CAD, red, and uh, well, it's not evident in this show. 
but size, obviously, these smaller ones were kind of, you know, these are kind of case studies or technical exercises um, that don't necessarily translate to larger paintings. I mean, I would never repaint this. Um, it's more about the idea, you know, working through this idea of ab abstraction and uh, kind of color composition. Not so much form, but, well, I guess form is in there, but and it's kind of funny. You, wanna, you know, you can go like this, or you can go like that, and it's like, whoa, what is that? We can go like that. That's what I love about abstract painting. I'm just kidding. This is the way it goes. Imagine if it went this way. <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense. That makes sense. I don't know why, but it just does. And then obviously once you scale it up, I mean, this is still relatively small. I think this is only four and a half by six and a half body-ish size. Um, lots of layers. There's a lot of, a lot of color on this painting, when, uh, under this painting. It's kind of funny. These are like abstract. If you, if you golf, if you know golf, um, you get uh, your scorecard, and on the scorecard, there's little kind of sketches or little uh, little blueprints of the the holes that you're playing, and they're kind of bird's eye view kind of uh, drawings. And in these kind of forms, I guess, uh, just subconsciously found their way into this painting. And so, this is almost like the tee off box on a par three with this kind of really wide squat green, you know. So maybe on Fridays they would put the pin placement easy and then Sunday they would kind of move it in the front corner because that would be really hard to land the ball in this area. And sand, water, it's kind of tee off box shapes, long par five. Of course, this all this is all unconscious. You know, I'm not thinking about these things. I mean, painting isn't all there is to life. You know, I have lots of other interests, golf being one of them, and so obviously, you know, aspects of that are going to find their way in, in, into my work. You know, and once you, you know, we'll come back to these. And, and you know, these, these kind of big, vast, <clears throat> just empty, a lot of empty space in these paintings. There's a, you know, that is allowing for a lot of area for contemplation, I guess. You know, it'd be totally different if it was just this. Well, I already do paintings like that. You know, it's about portraying this deep space that doesn't really exist. It's very dramatic lighting. I mean, where's this light source coming from? You know, these are the edges that I'm talking about. And same with this, you know, this is like forward and then ultimately, ultimately recedes back into this kind of red. I mean, it's kind of funny. It either looks like this is like a backdrop, like a, you know, a photo backdrop when you're in high school taking your picture and they have like kind of weird backdrop behind you. It looks like that, but it's not. It's actually a thresh. This is a threshold right here. This is where real space ends and it recedes into this fucking, recedes into this void. Why did I swear? 
The pain just gets me so angry. I don't want to look at it. And, and, and typically I, I will take a break from the kind of these bigger paintings dealing with these bigger issues, these big issues, to you know, these smaller paintings which are kind of discreet and quiet and like I said earlier with the small cigarette paintings, these are like punctuation marks, kind of breaks, brain breaks, you know, there's, there's not much to contemplate here, it's a still life with some minor significant, some minor, um, you know, kind of these objects of minor significance. We all know what those things are. You know, and this, this one is, is funny. This is like, we take it out into the light. You know, this painting is like as if, you know, you know, as if, uh, you know, there was a painting, this kind of betrayal this painting on a wall that was take sun soaked sta sun stained wall although it doesn't really make sense i mean it kind of does it's like what's going on here what are these things you know it's like this young boy wanting to play his target game but he's considerate enough to take his mom's painting off the wall it's kind of funny painting you know it's like I kind of just want to try and see if I can I'm going to take that top one off I think I got it. But yeah, I mean, these young, these figurative paintings, I don't have much to say about them. You know, somebody asked me what, in, what, in, uh, what inspired me to make these paintings, these young boy paintings. Well, obviously, I was inspired by young boys. All right, I'm going to hit him in the head. Close enough. You know, I, I guess, you know, this, you know, kind of when you're the kind of pre, you know, kind of curating, I guess I'm not really curating, but I'm, you know, directing the choreography of the show is trying to figure out, do I want to put kind of these smaller ones? Do I want to put these paintings that are so closely related to one, one another next to each other, or do I scatter it? And how does that change the context of the show? And I mean, ultimately I'm mediating this experience. Oh, of, of this painting show. You know, this is a painting show. And does that really, ch you know, affect how the show is perceived, you know, the painting's relationships to each other's, to each other? Um, or can you just look at each one individually? Or is it something to look at these small 
technical exercises and then be like, oh, okay, there it is. There's the one. You know, there's this, here's the one. There are those, there are these ones. But I don't know. I, uh, I don't know if, that, if I'm interested in that or if I would argue that it would do anything differently. All I know is I just, this painting is so annoying to look at. I don't think I'm the only one who thinks that. I know I'm not the only one who thinks that. You know, I kind of want to make, you know, I, I like kind of paintings that are daunting. Maybe that's not the right word. It's kind of this imminence in them. Impending doom, death. You know, I'm really big on death. It's humbling to think about death, I think. First thing I think about when I wake up. Last thing I think about when I go to sleep. Because that's what it would be like to die. I mean, depends how you die. JFK didn't think that. The pigeon breast, um, mimosa salad with the egg, so good. So it's a duck on um, A lot of people ask me like, why am I so interested in cooking French food or about, like hamburgers or Italian food? Why don't I make food that's, you know, part of my culture? Asian food. There is one. The, the roulade, the chicken roulade. It's got Guinland. It's like a, it's really nice actually. It's a deboned chicken breast with the skin on. I do a prawn pork, uh, kind of like a wonton filling some chestnut and, uh, you know, ginger scallion, uh, soy sesame oil, and uh, that's rolled in a blanched Guinlan leaf into this little kind of nugget, and then that's rolled into the, the chicken thigh, and it's, it's pretty good. It's a pretty nice dish. That's the only Asian thing I've ever made. <laughs> 